Um, for those of you who are watching, thank you so much. Uh, I'm Jonathan Bidlack, uh, the uh, director of the uh, Fiscal and Budget Policy Project at the R Street Institute. Um, and my guest today is a, a good friend of mine and a friend to everyone in the fiscally conservative space, uh, Ramina Bacha, the director of the Grover M. Herman, uh, uh, cent is it Center for the Federal Budget? Am I getting that right? That's it. Uh, at yeah. the Heritage Foundation, yeah. Uh, Ramina is a champion for um, fiscally conservative causes and uh, a great colleague and a great friend and uh, we're very lucky to have her with us today. So um, this conversation, as everyone knows, is to talk a little bit about uh, the CARES Act and sort of the, the federal um, response to the coronavirus pandemic that's happened so far, but also to talk a little bit about what's coming next and what should come next. Uh, you know, there has been talk for quite a while now that we need to have uh, you know, stimulus four, it's been called, I've heard it called stimulus 3.5, stimulus 3.1. So it kind of seems to change by the day. But um, I think it's really worth thinking, especially now that we've had three very substantive bills, um, what, what really should come next. And, and, you know, especially with Congress being out of session now to take a pause and, uh, um, and, and have that discussion before we kind of rush into, into, you know, next steps. Um, so I'm hoping this will be a, a great, you know, forward-looking conversation. Uh, to anyone who has questions, um, you know, you can uh, text them at the bottom. There's the Q&A section, um, and uh, we'll uh, we'll hold them till the end, and uh, hopefully to keep uh, keep 15 or 20 minutes at the end to get through all the questions. Um, I think, you know, I'll just say a few things at front. I mean, I think, you know, it's kind of an awkward position to some degree for fiscal conservatives who, you know, we're, we're so used to advocating that the federal government shouldn't do stuff. Um, and I think at the current moment, uh, most people acknowledge that there's some sort of, you know, federal role here. Uh, and, you know, obviously, you know, given that we have governments are basically forcing uh, people to not work, um, it, it seems, um, you know, that in many ways, the principled response is to, is to make people whole for that, for that hardship. Uh, and so it's, it, you know, we have sort of this trade-off, I think, between needing to act, um, but also needing to think about the, the medium and long-term consequences of the actions that we're taking. And we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit. Um, from my end, I mean, I think there are a few principles that we should think about moving forward. Um, one is that, you know, I, I've been kind of hammering on this notion that, that what, what we're really trying to do right now is provide relief rather than stimulus. You know, we don't want, uh, we're not asking people to go and, and you know, take their, take their checks and go uh, shop at their favorite stores or eat at their favorite restaurants. In fact, we're asking for the exact opposite. And so the response, the appropriate response from my end are, are, are policies that, uh, focus on sort of bridging that gap until we get to the point where the, um, the private sector is truly unleashed. Uh, and, you know, I think some of the policies that have been passed so far have, have done that and some, some maybe not, not as much. So, um, you know, I, I make a big distinction between, between relief and stimulus. And I think the other idea is that, you know, keeping it very targeted and frankly, keeping it temporary. You know, there's, a, there's always a tendency to have any policy in a, in a crisis situation like this, um, you know, get your sort of favorite policy to, uh, um, you know, be, be permanent. And that's not really appropriate right now. I think that the most important thing is that we address the coronavirus crisis. And if there are other things that it makes sense for, um, for the government to do, we can have that debate at the appropriate time. But I think the, the crisis right now is, I mean, you know, gosh, as we've seen the, we've seen all seen the unemployment numbers and seen those charts. I mean, this is a, you know, a spike in, in, in numbers and in a whole host of ways, unlike anything we've ever seen before. And so it makes sense that all of our resources and all of our efforts should be focused explicitly on, on rectifying this crisis. So um, I thought, you know, maybe we would start off a little bit, Ramina, in, and I can just kind of ask you to summarize a little bit, you know, what's happened so far, um, what you like and what you don't like, and, and if you're so willing, you know, maybe give a, a grade to uh, how you think the, the mm -hmm. federal, federal response has been up to this point. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad to do this. Thank you so much for having me on this conversation with you, Jonathan. It's, these are really important issues, and I think for the most part, we agree. And I'm going to go ahead and start with that and say that from the very beginning, my colleagues and I have really emphasized that the governmental response should be targeted, timely, and temporary. And you saw uh, that at the very beginning where you had this um, you had the emergency spending bill of roughly $8 billion, and then shortly thereafter, you had the president declare a national disaster, which freed up roughly $50 billion for states, localities, and territories uh, to fight uh, the coronavirus pandemic across the country. Those were, I think, targeted timely and clearly temporary responses. After that, I think there was also recognition that we were in a very different situation 
that required a very different response and specifically asking people not to go to work uh, for those people who can work from home, which depending on the region of the country, in urban centers, uh, almost half of the population can work from home, but in other parts of the country, it's just not as possible. If you're working in a factory setting, you can't do that uh, from home. So there are different uh, circumstances that people have encountered, but also as schools closed uh, and daycare centers closed, many people that, um, had their children in those facilities and then were going to work during the day, were no longer able to do that. And so the Families First Response Act really tried to address uh, those issues, allowing people who are sick to stay home without financial pressure and also enabling parents who might find themselves without childcare uh, to be able to take care of their children during these extraordinary circumstances. So what it provided was um, a, both a mandate initially for two weeks of paid leave. We were concerned about this. The uh, Department of Labor later stated that they could provide certain waivers for businesses where that simply was not feasible. Uh, but it also provided financial re relief through the payroll tax to allow businesses to pay their workers who cannot telework and who have qualifying condition, whether they're suffering from COVID-19, have a family member who's suffering from it, or have children that now require their care, or elderly parents, uh, really any dependents, that um, they would be able to stay home and still continue to be paid. And this is a temporary policy, and I think we all recognize that uh, we may have disagreements over what paid leave should look like for the United States. Some people really feel strongly that there ought to be a, a federal program or some government program. Uh, we have found that uh, employers working with their employees is the best way of providing that. One additional policy we would have liked to see from Congress in this space is allowing hourly wage workers to accrue uh, paid time off. We think that would have been especially timely and targeted and really a good policy that didn't need to be temporary, but that is overdue policy. Because if you look at state and local government workers, if they work overtime hours, they can decide whether they want to receive that as paid time off um, or if they want to be um, as cash wages or if they want to receive it as compensatory time off. And the unions have blocked that for private sector hourly wage workers. And if you think about if you have folks that are staying home now because they're sick or they're having to take care of children or other dependents, their coworkers are likely going to have to pick up additional shifts, which means that they can will accrue overtime. And some of that maybe makes most sense for them to get as cash, but it might also make sense to accrue paid time off in case they get sick or at a later time they have to stay at home. And that just seems like a simple common sense policy that we should all get behind. And my, um, my speculation for why the unions are against it is twofold. One, they wanna to continue to press for a federal or state government programs for paid leave. And if that group of workers, they're now saying, look, they don't have access to paid leave, all of a sudden have it through a, a voluntary mechanism that undermines their argument that we need a governmental program. And second, um, to the extent that unions live off of uh, the dues of their uh, paying members, if they earn overtime, then the unions are able to um, get the dues from the additional pay, whereas if they get it as time off, um, then the, do, uh, the unions can't get their share. But I think that's really troubling um, for those individuals and I would like to see more attention on that issue. And, and then I think after that, um, we started the everything but the kitchen sink approach and <laughs> that is, uh, I think the CARES Act. And on overall, I would say because of the good initial responses that I thought were targeted, timely and temporary, um, I would give Congress a C I think they did a lot right. They acted quickly. But then as we got into the CARES Act and discussions after that, I felt that we took more of an approach of let's just try all sorts of different things instead of um, debating what might work best. Let's just throw everything in there. And there was no consideration for how this would impact the fiscal picture in the long run. And also uh, there are policies that directly contradict each other in the CARES Act. I wanna spend more um, 
time talking about that are deeply problematic, that on the one hand undermine the very goals of the CARE Act and other policies from the Families First Response Act, and on the other hand, um, they also uh, set up really bad precedents that um, I think could, could haunt us in the long run, in addition to making the fiscal picture much worse uh, than it needed to be in order to provide more targeted uh, response. Um, and then we also saw, and we continue to see this now, the negotiations started falling apart, uh, less agreement between Democrats and Republicans, and especially uh, Democrats recently trying to use um, programs that both parties agree on, like the Paycheck Protection Program that ran out of money last Thursday, where really both parties said, okay, we need to provide more money for this program. This is a good program. It's acting in the way that we intended it uh, to, to use that to say, we will not agree to this good policy unless you add all these other things that maybe there is less agreement on really using it as leverage. So I think process is important and that we're gonna um, have better policies if Congress considers every policy on its own merits and uh, debates the individual components rather than uh, using a policy that everyone agrees is urgent and necessary and good to attach unrelated policies that uh, don't fit that bill. Yeah, I think that's the thing we face all the time with, you know, omnibus legislation. I think at one point I had one congressman mention that, that you know, they thought that the goal that would eventually be to just have one vote a year and we just put everything into that one, that one bill and, uh, and it gave you no choice to, to, to basically voice your opinion on, on those different aspects. I mean, we deal with this in a whole host of contexts. Um, and I think your point about the kitchen sink approach is really, uh, is really worth, worth digging into a little bit. I mean, I have been struck by how so much of what we seem to be doing now uh, seems to be very similar to what happened in 2008 and 2009, despite the nature of the, the crisis being very different. So, you know, in 2008 to 2009, I think we all know there was, a, you know, whether you see that as a failure of the marketplace or a failure of specific players in the marketplace, um, there was an argument that, uh, you know, essentially you had, you had people who stood to, to gain from um, from actions that had nothing to do with 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 what they what they themselves did, so you had people who took unnecessary risk um, and then profited from it, and then as a result, uh, on the on, or, you know, on the flip side, expected a government bailout to then go and uh, um, and provide them with benefits and make them whole for for actions that were of their own choosing. Uh, whereas at this point in time, right, I, I don't think uh, I mean if we if we if we look back to you know even three months ago the economy was humming along very well right we had record low unemployment we had extremely strong economic growth um, and I, I've been making the analogy that you know what we're facing is almost akin to an asteroid coming in and striking the earth right it's a completely exogenous shock that um, really had nothing to do with the actions of anyone in uh, you know in the private sector and yet um, the response that we've seen I think has been very similar and uh, I wonder what you think about that. I mean, I, you know, my personal view is that a lot of it has to do with the fact that it's just the last crisis and it's the playbook that we know and that we're comfortable with. And uh, so we've got all these different components, you know, uh, benefits to individuals, benefits to those who uh, are out of work. We have support for small businesses, support for large businesses. We have talk about giving money to the states. We have all these sorts of things that are really um, very similar to what we saw before. And um, you know, I wonder if you think that that's, if that's the right approach, um, or if there's something different that, that policymakers should be thinking about. I don't think it's uh, the right approach. As you mentioned, we are in a very different scenario than we were in 2008. This is a very different crisis. This is not an economic crisis, first and foremost. This is a public health crisis. And the uh, actions taken to mitigate the public health crisis are, have now resulted in the economy being frozen and the potential for an economic crisis. And a lot of the relief measures were, um, were intended to create that bridge, as you mentioned earlier, from a temporarily frozen economy where we're asking people not to interact very much and stay home for the most part, uh, to back to returning to something more like normal in staged phases um, over time, as we get more control of the virus, are able to um, contain uh, the, uh, the spread better, uh, get our hospital resources uh, to a point where they can uh, deal with um, the different inflow of people that need help uh, if, if they're suffering from, from coronavirus, while also continuing to be able to 
treat those who have other conditions that are not coronavirus related. A lot of what we're doing right now was intended to be temporary to get a better, but get more control of the virus spread, understand the issue better, gather more data so we could do more efficient um, testing and then tracing. And instead of this widespread approach where we're shutting down the entire economy, uh, but the, the whole stimulus approach is the exact opposite of what we need to be doing right now. The, the goal was to preserve, or should have been, to preserve the infrastructure and the networks that existed in our economy mm -hmm. that we needed to temporarily disrupt, almost like asking everyone to go on vacation for a month. And then to allow those networks to be revived, that infrastructure to come back to life uh, with businesses reopening, bringing their workers back and, um, and, and having a strong, vibrant recovery. But that, all of that depends on how long this frozen state persists. And when we entered it, we entered it with a lot of uncertainty the uh, United States and most countries across the globe have not dealt with um, that kind of a, a pandemic level crisis in a, in a long time that is so widespread where Whatever. the beginning, yeah, it's been, um, so, so all that uncertainty meant that we didn't really know how long it was gonna last. And we're still sort of wondering how we're returning to normal. There is that question with Georgia, for example, announcing that they're gonna let people go back to restaurants and open up most businesses. What will that mean for that state? And it really also, I think, illustrates that we need localized approaches to this. Uh, but the, like the stimulus checks, I thought, was misguided. That, was, that came straight out of the 2008 playbook. It didn't work very well then. And I think it was especially the wrong approach in this crisis. And also the expanded unemployment benefits, I think are particularly troubling because they directly counteract the goals of the Paycheck Protection Program, which were to provide businesses with the liquidity in the form of grants to keep their workers employed, keep them attached to their health insurance and enable those businesses to bring those people back to work once they're able to reopen. Now we're encouraging people by paying them excessive unemployment benefits where half of the working population can come out ahead going on unemployment rather than staying employed, at least on, on the cash financial side of things, um, that we're encouraging people to, to go on unemployment. And we're also making it easier for a lot of businesses to lay people off. The other, things, uh, other thing I've been seeing is that some businesses are planning around that um, dilemma if you will, where they've applied for the PPP loan, but they actually request a start date that's at the end of May. Because what they're doing now is they're furloughing their workers, encouraging them to go on unemployment, and then they wanna use the PPP loan to rehire them as they get their businesses back up and running. Mm -hmm. And you know, in many ways I can't fault them because they're also dealing with rent and utilities and other costs and, um, and also they're not sure, am I, am I gonna be able to stay open depending on how long this lasts? So it's one way that they can put off that decision. And we have seen many businesses go under, but then others will be scooped up. Right. And uh, a crisis is always an opportunity for some, um, but of course this is a, a tragedy for most of us and the entire country. But I also think that there is a danger in thinking that we can make people whole and do that for very long. Right. Um, even if we had unlimited amounts of funds, which we do not, um, there's so much to um, also, th there are public health consequences of people being confined to their homes, not being able to engage socially. I mean, American society has come to a standstill, really. It's not just the economy. Um, and, and those are all considerations we have to consider that where government can't make you whole, even if they tried. Yeah, I think there's a, I think that's right. It's a, um, you know, one of the things I think that shifted from the policymakers standpoint is that in the beginning, there was almost this view that this was going to last two weeks and then it was, was going to be over and we were just going to flip that proverbial switch and everything was going to go back to the way that it was on January 1st. And I think, uh, I think a lot of policymakers were slow to come to the realization that we're dealing with a, a crisis that is much, uh, you know, much greater than that and much longer lasting. And and perhaps the the proposals that you want in in that type of crisis, 
um, you know, are very different than what you might want in something that is short term. Um, so a lot of things to unpack. Let's maybe get into something that's a little bit fun where you and I actually have a disagreement. You know, I, I am actually of the perspective that cash payments uh, are arguably more appropriate now than, than uh, they ever would have been in another, in another context. And my argument there is sort of twofold. One is that um, the, the, the current situation is so great and changing so rapidly that the idea that government will be able to effectively target aid to those people who truly need it um, is very difficult, right? We know that, that you know, the government's generally not very good at this. I mean, my own brother, for example, to, to your point, um, has been furloughed for two months from, from his job as of, as of April 1st. Um, and so, you know, like, uh, you know, now millions of Americans, he applied for unemployment benefits and still has his claim pending, can't get anyone on the phone. You have no idea what will end up, end up happening as a result. And, you know, he's fortunate to be in a position where he has savings and is able to deal with, uh, uh, you know, the situation, at least in the, in the short term. Um, and, but I think the, the idea that a lot of people had was, well, let's just put all the money into unemployment and, and that's going to solve the situation. Well, the problem with that is that, um, you know, we're not talking about an increase in unemployment of five or 10%. We're talking about an increase in unemployment uh, numbers of, of, you know, hundreds and, and thousands of percent, depending on the state. So um, most sort of government, you know, pre-existing entities aren't really capable of, of handling that. Um, and because the situation is changing so rapidly, um, you know, my sort of view is that the, the, the best thing you can do is essentially keep it simple, stupid, um, and get cash out people as quickly as possible. Um, and, and you're right that there are obviously long-term consequences to that. But if you, if you actually look at the, the, you know, the percentage of the CARES Act that, uh, that went to direct aid versus other things, it's actually not that large. I think the, the estimate is something like $260 billion for cash payments out of a, you know, I mean, the, 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 the price tag was given as 2.3 trillion. The CBO score came out last week and it puts it at the, the new spending at about 1.3 trillion. But regardless, we're looking at, you know, under a third, maybe a quarter of the bill uh, was actually direct support. And so, um, you know, my viewpoint is that, uh, you know, certainly in normal times, that wouldn't necessarily be a, something that I would advocate for. And, and maybe even in the context of, of you know, um, uh, you know, recessions or sort of uh, shocks that we've had in the past, it wouldn't be inappropriate. But in this particular case, um, I, I see it as the most effective, um, uh, you know, solution that, that we, we could have. Um, it's certainly not perfect. And, and the reality is the you know, as uh, and to, to make that asteroid comparison again, right, we really haven't dealt with um, a crisis that of this nature before. And so it's kind of unclear which tools in the toolkit are the, you know, it, it's not like you can just pick up the economics textbook, right, and, and, and get the answer, you know, this is how we handle things in, you know, World War Two, or pick, you know, pick whatever sort of situation in, in the past. Uh, and so a lot of it is, I think, you know, policymakers have been kind of flying by the seat of their pants. And, and you know that's probably why we've seen a little bit of that uh, that that kitchen sink approach. Um, but you know maybe we should talk a little bit more too about you know how I mentioned earlier the the short term versus the long term implications because you know one of the concerns that I think a lot of us have is that you know regardless of of what solutions we take right now and what may or may not be the, the best um, we are going to have to pay for these at some point. These are you know that we are going to have to consider those costs. Um, you know maybe now isn't the time to be thinking about offsets, uh, you know, or, or things of that nature. But at some point, um, you know, we were already running a trillion dollar deficit prior to this crisis. Um, and now the estimates are, are that we're going to be running a much, much larger deficit. Um, and of course, the longer that the coronavirus pandemic goes on, the, the larger those numbers are likely to become. So, um, you know, I'm curious as to what your thoughts are on how we weigh these different concerns. I mean, how do we, how do we, you know, decide what we, uh, what is enough to sort of get us through the current crisis without creating a situation where we, you know, I mean, maybe bankruptcy of the country is not really what's in the cards, but certainly a situation where, uh, where we'll be squeezing out things that might be other, you know, good priorities just because of, you know, say increased debt service payments. I think that uh, our lawmakers have been too focused on um, economic stimulus rather than um, figuring out that in the end, good public health policy is gonna be also good economic policy. Because to some degree, businesses are shuttered because of orders given by governors. But to some degree, I think people are also 
afraid to leave their homes. They have been informed now, they understand this is really dangerous, they're afraid for their loved ones, elderly individuals. Many people are avoiding going to the hospital with conditions like uh, heart attacks or having uh, stroke sy sy syndromes and they're coming in really late. Those are some uh, other costs that we need to consider that uh, we're not fully accounting for right now that are gonna have public health and therefore also economic uh, consequences on the on the you know getting cash out to everyone the administrative uh, hurdles that governments have to overcome to really do this effectively I think a lot of policy analysts just assumed that if we pass this really quickly and the money will go out really quickly like Congress enacts the law today and tomorrow everyone will have their money and then a reality well, set does to some. I, mean, I, I think that the big issue, as we know, is that you know when they have direct deposit available, then that was theoretically possible, right? And we've seen a lot. But you're right that a lot of people file by paper or through other cases, and that becomes a huge, for sure, a huge obstacle. I did uh, appreciate seeing that um, civil society also needs to play a role. You know, the civil society can't make up for and the 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 decline of an entire economy or large parts of an economy, but they, they do know um, oftentimes who are the people that are in need, who are the people that are vulnerable. Mm -hmm. You saw restaurants, for example, recognizing that oftentimes their staff would get their only hot meal while they're working their shift, um, continuing to open their doors to provide that assistance so people would eat. Um, lots of folks set up different mechanisms to get cash directly into the hands of uh, waiters and bartenders uh, with some really innovative approaches um, where folks could send money via PayPal and Venmo directly. I also love seeing the initiative by uh, giving together now uh, which is an arm of Stand Together yes. that um, raised money to provide cash through civil society institutions that are that know about the people who are in need in their communities, at least who were in need that were already getting services from these organizations and who have mechanisms to, to vet others who may be in assistance as long as they feel comfortable coming forward and asking for that help mm -hmm. to be able to get those cash uh, payments to individuals out much, much faster. But you also have to think to the degree that people who can work from home who may not have seen a large drop in their income, um, they're getting the same $1,200 per person um, income as you know, a family that may have lost one or both of their uh, breadwinners and that have really fallen on hard times. And if you give everyone the same payment, um, that might mean that that family that needs more um, isn't getting it and somebody else yeah. who doesn't I, need it is getting it. So it's not targeted. Yeah, yeah, I think, and I think that gets back to that trade-off between it's just, uh, you know, conceptually, I think that's exactly right. I think the challenge of course is that um, government's just not very good at determining that, right? And I, they obviously- How do you do that, yeah. Right. Right. I mean, I think they tried to hack at it a little bit with, you know, additional benefits for families with kids and, and what have you. And there and so there that was sort of an attempt at doing that. But um, but yeah, it's a, it's the trade off between simplicity versus, um, you know, uh, trying to go and really uh, reaching the people that right. you need to reach. And how right. do you do that? But then it's also like, well, if we can't do that, should we even be doing that or should we be doing something else? Yeah. And I think. And, I think I think from my end, the uh, the value that I see is that again, with the situation getting getting you know bad so quickly, um, I think it, I think it was the best tool we had in the in the toolkit. I mean, I would I would argue the way the the smartest way to structure it was was not as some sort of one time payment anyway, but basically you do something that people can know they can count on, and maybe it's not as much as twelve hundred, but it's a it has some sort of economic trigger so that when the economy is improving, that program is ratcheted down because. I think for me, the bigger concern is is this idea that that some of the things that are being done now uh, become a permanent part of the fiscal picture rather than keeping them as the temporary measure that they were originally or at least should be intended to be. I mean, you know, I, I think um, most people conceptually would say, yes, we should provide unemployment to people who are who are out of work. The problem is, um, you know, once July rolls around, we all know there's going to be that push to continue along those increased benefits when we may or may not be in the current crisis. And, and obviously, there's, there are ideological disagreements as to what the role of government is in this kind of situation. But I would just argue that there's a very big distinction to be made between government's role in the context of a very bad crisis that 
admittedly is is in part you know brought on by governmental actions um, which 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 in my personal opinion are very much warranted actions um, but but there's no getting around the fact that um, that's part of the reason why you know they're that the government is taking the actions that they are and so um, so that you know these are the these are the kinds of challenges I think that that you know we, we as fiscal conservatives are going to have to think about is uh, you know and 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 just to maybe close up this topic on cash payments, I mean, I think that the the value that I see is I also see it being as something that's less likely to be something that is a permanent change. Uh, whereas I think we are going to have very real battles on the, on uh, in the the horizon with respect to unemployment insurance or some of the other sort of programs that um, that people will get used to, and and so that those are the those are the concerns that I have. Yeah, um, I mean, I maybe- share those concerns. I saw the Economist on Saturday. Um, talked about the $600 UI payment as the United States experiment with a universal basic income. Uh, The idea being also that we've significantly raised the reservation wage at which people are willing to take a job, at least for the duration of uh, that payment. And uh, we do believe that it's going to roughly double the number of people that are going on unemployment, all else equal because it's become so lucrative uh, for many people to claim that $600 uh, UI bump up in addition to what they might have already been eligible yeah. for. With the I average think- payment up to $1,000 a week. Yeah. I mean, think about how many people could, um, could, could hope to earn that much in any given week, and now they can collect it via UI. I think this is extremely uh, dangerous. Well, and I think that gets to the point of whether or not people see it as permanent. I mean, you know, to to use my brother as an example again, I mean, I think he would be perfectly, he, he would prefer to be, you know, uh, to be working right now. Um, now, obviously, that's not, that's not possible. Um, I think that, you know, if people saw those benefits as something that were likely to continue beyond the end of July, um, then the problems you're describing have the potential to become much greater. I mean, I, I, my personal view is that in the short term, the bigger, the bigger potential harm isn't necessarily people deciding not to work themselves, but businesses, for the reasons you mentioned earlier, deciding that, well, we can furlough employees or don't have to go and pay employees because we know that government benefits are going to be there to, to back them up. Now, that's a problem that, you know, there may be no way around that, right? I mean, it's, it's sort of a, there's, there's not necessarily a good, a good solution. Um, but uh, I do I think, think so. So one solution that was discussed was capping the unemployment payment at 100% of your wages. Right. That was okay. an amendment that was offered in Congress. I think even that would have been generous. Um, e- capping it at 80% of wages, you know, would have been more generous than normal unemployment, recognizing mm-hmm. the current situation without actively encouraging people to uh, to go on unemployment and giving b- businesses that pass to say, you know, under other circumstances, maybe I would have kept people on payroll. Now they feel relieved of that burden, of that responsibility. Right. The worker even is thankful. Oh, good. I'm going to be collecting this unemployment and within the hope still that hopefully they'll, they'll be rehired once that is possible. But it could uh, prolong and deepen uh, the downturn. And yeah, also I- the other thing is some businesses are trying to hire right now, like Amazon is right. uh, trying to hire. They've seen a huge uptake in demand. And there are other businesses like my nursery down the street that is just being bombarded with requests for people trying to beautify their backyards because they've got nothing uh, nothing better and nothing else to do. Or you might have heard of the Victory Garden. So there are businesses that have seen an uptick in demand. Most businesses are suffering. Uh, but they're going to have a hard time hiring folks, even for available jobs, if you can collect more by the Yeah, I mean, maybe, maybe we should talk a little bit about what that appropriate business response is, because I think we all know that uh, just like in 2008, the, the, the push that we're seeing is that, you know, all sorts of industries coming to the table and saying that, you know, well, they're hurting and so they need a bailout. Um, and, you know, we've seen that from the airlines, we've seen that from, you know, a number of different industries. And um, you know, those arguments, I guess the arguments that we typically uh, make tend to fall maybe on deaf ears in the, in the crisis situation, because there are people who are hurting and there's a, you know, there's sort of a, um, it's a it, it tugs at your heartstrings a little bit and, and perhaps rightfully so. It doesn't necessarily mean that the policy action is warranted, but um, I mean, what do you think the appropriate, you know, business response is? I mean, I think, you know, my, my personal view is that the Paycheck Protection Program is, again, not a perfect solution, but it's probably the best we can hope for. It's basically akin to what we've seen 
um, you know, most Northern European countries do. Um, but, you know, the longer this goes on, uh, as we're seeing with funds already running out once and cases of businesses perhaps that didn't need those funds getting access to them, um, you know, that becomes very expensive very quickly. And so uh, I wonder if you have thoughts on, on sort of um, how we might address those issues that, you know, maybe we need something totally different than PPP. Um, or, uh, you know, I mean, an, another solution that was part of the CARES Act was this idea of a discretionary fund, basically, you know, $454 billion, basically just given to the Treasury Secretary with relatively little oversight. Um, now, I don't particularly support that, but there's an argument to be made that in this kind of situation, that's the best thing you can hope for. You just need someone to oversee it. You need to get rid of the bureaucratic tape and, um, and allow someone to make the call as to whether or not this industry or that company deserves, deserves that support. So. Um, I'm curious as to what you think are the, uh, the you know, perhaps the, what would the ideal for Mina Bacha, you know, business <laughs> plan look like in the, in the current situation? Yeah, um, the best I think we can hope for is uh, damage control and not unnecessarily prolonging the period of time where businesses and individuals will be um, reliant on the government because of uh, actions and maybe also actions that weren't taken to contain the spread of the virus and uh, really a blunt approach to what we're currently doing uh, that is applies to the entire country in many ways and across states when it really we need a community specific approach we need a zip code specific approach we need to use local knowledge on the ground and also allow people to make uh, decisions that are best for them uh, and their families and i don't think we can in the long run um, paper over the losses that are happening with federal government action. I think that was always something that would ha uh, could help in the short run. Programs like the Paycheck Protection Program will only work effectively as long as they're short run programs where you're trying to keep people attached to their employers uh, for a period of weeks, maybe two months. But you really can't do that much longer where that makes any more sense because if, we, if this goes on for many, many months, we're gonna find ourselves in a very different economy on the other side of this. And how much do you think that the timing matters? Because one of the other points I think that's been missed by a lot of people is that you know, what may have been the appropriate action a month ago or a month and a half ago may no longer be the appropriate action today, right? Something that may, if you could plan for the situation, know it's coming and immediately pass some sort of proposal, um, that may look very different than, you know, what you do in the situation where the crisis is here. I mean, you know, I think I, I agree with you on, on the need for a localized approach. Uh, I think that's somewhat difficult to do. Um, you know, I, one of the points that I think we forget is that, I mean, people talk about social distancing as being a, a public health measure, and it is, but it's also very much an economic policy as well, right? There are significant um, economic uh, consequences, um, some good and some bad as a result of, of following that policy. Um, but I'm curious as to, you know, uh, you know how, how have your views perhaps changed, or maybe they haven't, from what you might have thought, you know, a month and a half ago, knowing now that the crisis is deeper, um, and knowing that, you know, what we've seen the federal response already being up to this point, um, do you feel like your, um, your perspective has changed a little bit as we've learned more about, about the crisis as far as what makes the most sense from a, from a fiscal standpoint going forward? Yeah, I think that um, coming out of 2008, uh, no bailouts basically was my position that that didn't make sense. But you talked about the airlines earlier and I mean, we've travel restrictions, social distancing measures, canceling business travel conferences. These are all things that are happening to the airlines through no fault of their own. And then we also have service requirements imposed on them where we expect them to fly certain um, routes, maybe to get lawmakers uh, home and back to Washington, D.C., and we depend on them and we're demanding a lot of them. Mm -hmm. And who somebody needs to uh, absorb those losses, and it's not clear to me that those should be uh, the airlines and their shareholders since they haven't done anything wrong. Yeah. Nobody has really, you know, has anybody done anything wrong? Maybe we can blame China for being um, not very forthcoming with information that perhaps could have helped us 
to uh, address the threat from the virus without these widespread, really unprecedented measures where we're putting the entire economy, not just in this country, but in countries across the globe into a, into a standstill. I mean, this is, these are exceptional actions that governments have taken. And um, we, do need, we should wonder if we could have prevented these extreme measures and therefore also the extreme economic fallout that we're now witnessing. But I also think that um, my views haven't changed that much. I still believe that all of the measures, like the paid leave, I think made sense given the circumstances. Mm -hmm. The uh, PPP program uh, made sense, but it should be targeted towards businesses that are suffering actual revenue losses not uh, any business that experiences any uncertainty from coronavirus, which is all businesses. So that's something we've been pushing for because it's limited funds. I mean, the program ran out of money after servicing only 1.6 million eligible businesses. And what was right. the total number? 30 or 60 million, if you include self-employed individuals. Right. Um, like, well, how are we going to do that? We cannot make everyone whole, especially for a long period of time. And I think that was ever the goal. I think it was to avoid widespread uh, defaults and businesses shutting down uh, in, in, in a massive way. Some businesses will use this as an opportunity to close down. They may have had weaknesses they experienced before this. That is a market correction for them that also makes sense. But we really need to work on um, getting back to some semblance of normal, allowing people to go back to work and targeting um, the coronavirus mitigation efforts more towards vulnerable individuals uh, because we cannot afford to keep the country shut down until there is a vaccine. I don't think that's feasible, reasonable. Yeah, I um, agree with you on that point. I think it's, um, I think the challenge, of course, with, with, with sending people back to work is that um, a lot of it comes down, to, I guess it's a question of whether you believe that people are following um, government edicts or if government edicts are following what people ultimately are doing otherwise. I mean, if you look at, for example, the restaurant data in, uh, in the state of Ohio, um, people stopped going to restaurants, uh, you know, to a large degree uh, before there were any bans on preventing people from going to restaurants. And so, I mean, if you look at Wuhan, for example, which is now opened up entirely, there is literally zero demand for restaurants right now. So I, um, I think there's a distinction to be made between between opening up the economy and having it open. And, and, and I think what people mean when they say open up the economy, which is that people are doing things that, you know, they are engaging in economic activity that, um, that they want to engage in. But at the end of the day, to, to sort of riff off something you said earlier, if people don't feel safe, if we don't feel that the virus is controlled to some degree, um, I don't know that there's a whole lot that can be done in terms of opening up the economy. And so I think uh, to your point, I mean, the, the actions, the federal actions that were taken immediately and, and, and that you know, should continue to be prioritized are things like masks and PPEs and other sort of uh, anything that can be done to, um, to continue to get control over the, um, over the virus. Because I think, there's a, I think there's a little bit of a myth that's been floating around that we can sort of separate the public health questions from the economic questions. Um, but, you know, as I said earlier, I mean, you know, the reason that the economy shut down like it did was because of this public health problem. And so, you know, I, I, for all of the talk and all of the, the actions that have been taken at the federal level, I don't know that there's anything that will, that will resolve the economic situation quicker uh, than actually addressing and getting the public health crisis under control. And, um, you know, and so that's a, that I think is at its core, the challenge that we're facing. And I think, you know, to some degree, I mean, at the end of the day, governors are deciding and, uh, you know, what the appropriate actions are for their states um, and different governors are taking different actions that, um, you know, you or I may, may like, may not like, but there is a little bit of the ability to look at the situation in the state and decide what are the appropriate actions. Um, and to some degree, you end up getting a natural experiment as a result of that. Um, you know, it's a, again, it, it's, it's a very tough natural experiment, obviously, because you're talking about people's lives and ultimately that's the most important thing, but it's, um, you know, it's a, this is, it's a very tough, tough situation. And I think it's a, I think sometimes, um, you know, people who come at things from the fiscal background, like we do, you, you sort of, you always want to have, you know, the, the, the mindset of if we just had this perfect rule in place, everything would, would be fixed. But, you know, as we know from, from battles to go and balance the budget more generally, um, there's so many variables that play that really determine whether or not those rules are effective. And so, um, you know, I am personally more skeptical of the idea of, of open up, opening up the economy, at least right now, because I don't, not because I, I don't want to, but because I don't really think it's possible until we ultimately get those 
um, you know, get the public health crisis under control. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is, you know, you've talked about, I think we should maybe talk a little bit about oversight and transparency. I mean, these are words that people throw around all the time. Um, but I, you know, I, I think whenever we're talking about, I mean, a spending package that's this large, uh, it's obviously incredibly necessary. And how you think about oversight and transparency um, is just is just really important. Um, you know, I am personally, as I mentioned earlier, very supportive of the notion of, of a special inspector general. Um, I think it was one of the few things that came out of the um, the 2008 2009 government response that fiscal conservatives could actually be happy about. Um, you know, I think that there's there's strong evidence that um, inspector generals are or maybe one of the few things we spend money on that's actually worth it. Um, you know, if you look at, for example, you know, the, the revelations with respect to the conflict in Afghanistan, I mean, those revelations never would have occurred if we hadn't had a special inspector general asking those questions. And so um, I just, I'm curious as to your thoughts, you know, more broadly here, you know, given that we have passed these bills and given that there may be something more coming, um, what do you think is the appropriate oversight mechanism? How do we sort of make this as transparent as possible so that if government is going to take these actions, um, you know, how do we make sure we minimize the, the proverbial waste, fraud, and abuse and corruption? Uh, or is there anything that we can do? Maybe, maybe at the end of the day, it, it's, uh, you know, that's just the challenge of, uh, of, of governmental action. I certainly think it's uh, worth having additional individuals like a commission instead of what, just one person at Treasury um, looking into who's getting those monies, how is it money being used. If you look at some of the strings that got attached to uh, the grants and loans for various industries, including the airlines, some of them may make sense while those businesses ha uh, carry loans that taxpayers are on the hook for, uh, mm -hmm. but those conditions should be um, should should be should be gone once those loans are paid off. So, for example, buyback restrictions for uh, certain larger uh, companies. Yeah, that might make sense. While you're having taxpayers on the hook, you want to make sure that taxpayers get repaid first. But then it doesn't make sense to impose those for an additional year. I think there's a tension between trying to do what's right and then also. Mm -hmm. Uh, abusing a, uh, a, a crisis for political gain. And we saw too much of that, I think, during the negotiations. I also want to shift gears a little bit and talk about what's going to happen after this. One of the um, one of the crises we might find ourselves in on the other side of COVID-19, once the public health crisis is abated, is that uh, we will have uh, roughly tripled the deficit uh, the debt will be significantly larger and we will face the challenge of uh, making sure that temporary programs remain uh, temporary and don't become permanent features of our uh, fiscal makeup. And I think one of the real risks right now is states asking for unrestricted aid. Uh, Congress provided them with money specifically to support them in their efforts to fight the coronavirus. And I think the federal government, you could argue, had a role there to play. But for states to be asking for money to practically bail out their pension plans, Illinois was pretty uh, uh, forward about that, what they were trying to do with the money. I think that is particularly troubling because you're looking at roughly $7 trillion in unfunded uh, liabilities on the state and local level as it pertains to pensions and health care benefits. Um, and we also have a conversation now about the Postal Service, yes, which is absolutely. saying that they might go bankrupt this year. And, and so it's really dangerous that this is going to spill over into not just uh, doing what we need to do to fight the coronavirus, but um, into let's use this as an opportunity to sack federal taxpayers with all these unfunded obligations and liabilities that we could never get away with. But right now we can just claim this has all to do, everything to do with the coronavirus and people won't bet an eye as the deficit and debt go up. So I'm hopeful, <laughs> maybe I'm too optimistic that <laughs> Uh, we'll be able to come together as a country because of all the shared sacrifices we're having to make right now, where we're, as individuals, taking a step back to protect the most vulnerable. Uh, we're putting up with a lot of restrictions on our lives in an understanding that it's better 
for everyone. And that is what we need to do right now to allow our country to reemerge strong on the other side. Mm -hmm. And I hope that this will carry over into uh, forging that grand bargain, if you will, that we weren't able to make happen in uh, 2011 coming out, of, coming out of the Great Recession. And then this will be a, an opportunity for us to really um, come together as a country to protect current and future generations from um, out of control spending and unfunded liabilities that our politicians keep taking on uh, without making provisions to pay for them within the current generation. And if you look at countries that have adopted sustainable fiscal measures and better budget processes that allow them to, um, to have political debate about you know, the size and scope of government, but do so within the constraints of what we gotta pay for the government that we wanna have, Mm -hmm. I think you get better outcomes that way. And those countries did that all following some major crises in the 90s, primarily Sweden, Germany, Switzerland come to mind. Um, we should be thinking about this as well as we're spending so much money right now fighting the crisis. How can we come together as a country to also pay that back and do that within our generation um, and um, and, and, and controlling the growth in long run spending because we had a trillion dollar deficit that was growing before we ever got into this crisis. And I think those will be very important conversations uh, to consider. And uh, one last point I wanna make, to what degree was the federal government's response botched because they're distracted by being involved in so many areas that really should be left to the private sector and to states and localities where they're not focusing on oversight, where they're not focusing on um, truly national priorities where it makes sense to have activities take place in Washington. Instead, they're meddling in affairs on a state, local, and private level, over-regulating, sending money to the states. We just put out a paper. It showed that the uh, share of state budgets that come from the federal government on average is 23%. Right. That's crazy. That's a huge amount. Um, I think we should reconsider those policies in light of this crisis to focus the federal government on what we need them to be focused on mm -hmm. and uh, to free up governors and individuals and states and localities to um, address local issues uh, closer to the people on the ground. Yeah, I think that's I think that's accurate. Um, you know, we have a few minutes left, so if anyone has any questions and wants to uh, enter them at the bottom, uh, we're happy to happy to address them. I think uh, one of the points you made that I'll emphasize is just really important is, you know, this if there's a silver lining perhaps from the fiscal standpoint of what we've seen right now, uh, it's that um, it's made very clear the importance of being fiscally responsible when times are good. Uh, and I think that there's going to have to be a, a rethinking about how we handle not just, you know, pandemic emergencies, but, you know, what about, you know, floods or natural disasters or these other sorts of things that have happened on a small scale. Uh, I think there's sort of been the attitude at the federal level for, for too long of a time that all we need to do uh, is just, oh, appropriate more money, have an emergency supplemental bill, and that will take care of that. And, uh, and we don't really need to plan for these sorts of things. And, and you and I know that at the state level, um, and, and really many countries as well, you know, you'll have things like rainy day funds or budget stabilization funds that, uh, you know, allow you to um, perhaps save up a little bit. In fact, one of the reasons that many states have been able to deal, at least in part with the, uh, the current coronavirus uh, crisis, is that they had rebuilt their rainy day funds uh, after the 2008-2009 fiscal crisis. And so um, that's not the only answer. Um, there, are, there are other, I think, ideas that can be on the table, but uh, I think there, there will need to be, when we come out of this on the other side, a rethinking about how do we plan for these kinds of, um, you know, these kinds of crises. And, uh, uh, you know, there's, again, with a lot of these questions, there's rarely the perfect solution, but uh, there's definitely going to be a, um, uh, mm -hmm. I think, a, a need to talk about it a lot more than, than most policymakers have really been willing to, um, to address up to this point. Um, we have a question, um, Patricia asks, uh, and says, Thomas Massey's been talking about prioritizing single issue bills. Uh, you know, and I think you mentioned this earlier, Ramina, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I wonder to what degree do you think that that's possible, um, even if we're only talking for, uh, you know, disaster or, or crisis mm -hmm. bills like this? Yeah, you know, we have a political process. You have to get folks to come to the table. Uh, Senator McConnell tried that with the PPP expansion. It was going to be a clean bill, even though we thought that there should be some uh, restrictions and, you know, who's going to get 
this forgiveness should be targeted to businesses suffering actual revenue losses, but uh, conservatives took a step back and said, for the sake of making sure that businesses have access to these funds, uh, let's go with a clean bill. And then um, the Democrats didn't like it and they wanted to put other stuff in there. And if you see, I think that we're gonna, they might vote today on a bill today or tomorrow right. and it won't be that clean bill. It'll have other stuff in it as well. And I do think it makes sense, especially uh, during a crisis like this, where there is the potential always for lawmakers to abuse it, to push unrelated priorities by attaching them to otherwise critical and necessary aid, um, to push single issue bills. I think that should be um, how we do these things. You know, with the CARES Act, you might have said we need, you know, there's all these things we can, if we had to debate every issue individually, then it would take too long. But I don't know that that's really true, but because in the end, you still have to consider all the components. So if you had to take a separate vote on each of them, then you know um, what um, where, where both parties fall, where our representatives and are, and that we can hold them accountable if they're making exactly, the wrong decision. That's exactly right. And, and, you know, I mean, look, someone's having those discussions, right? Whether or not it's lawmakers on the floor of the House and Senate, you know, perhaps not. Um, but someone in a closed room, right, like the people who are drafting the legislation and deciding what the priorities are, are having to have those discussions. And so to your point, I mean, I think it's, a, uh, it's very reasonable to say that those discussions should be happening out in the open, that we should, ultimately, it's individual votes that are going to allow there to be a higher level of, uh, of accountability than there otherwise would be. I mean, you're familiar with my spending tracker tool, which, you know, basically tracks every individual vote and how much spending is in every bill. Um, you know, if we have one vote on just one piece of legislation, it becomes a useless tool, right? The, the real yeah. value is being able to see what are people voting for and uh, what do they support and, and not support, and then ultimately being able to hold them accountable. I think, you know, of course, in, in this kind of situation, there's, uh, uh, you know, these are, these are very special circumstances for sure. Uh, and, I, and that's to the point where I think that, you know, there needs to be a little bit more planning. I think that sometimes people make the argument that, well, we just needed more, more, you know, spending to prevent pandemics ahead of time. But the problem is there's always going to be something new that we're not going to think about. And so the better solution uh, is to have something that, you know, creates flexibility, I think, where um, mm -hmm. you can plan for any kind of crisis and have the flexibility to be able to, to um, you know, use funds for, for whatever immediate need may ultimately matter. But, um, well, I think it's been about an hour. I don't know if there are any other questions. We're happy to answer them. But, uh, uh, if not, thank you so much, Romina, for, uh, for taking your time. I think it's been a great discussion. And uh, uh, I think we have, obviously, as we know, areas of agreement and maybe a few areas of disagreement. But I think the, um, uh, the thing that we, we certainly agree on is that, you know, as we eventually come out of the, of the current situation, uh, it's going to be the private sector that's going to ultimately be responsible for, um, for you know, resolving the, and, and bringing society as close back to normal as possible. Um, and, and we're going to have some very big governmental questions that we're going to have to think about as well uh, that, uh, you know, hopefully some fiscal conservatives like us will have, uh, have some solutions for and, uh, and hopefully we'll perhaps find, uh, find lawmakers being a little bit willing, more willing than, than even in the past to, to consider some of these notions and to realize that, um, you know, your, uh, your, your economic strength is one of, the, one of the most powerful things that the United States has. And, uh, to the degree that that we allow the federal budget to get into a situation to where it's not able to, um, not able to to uh, you know account or deal with these sorts of situations, um, that's that's on us. You know, we ultimately as a country have to decide what those priorities are, and one of those priorities has to be a a, a responsible federal budget. So, um, so uh, thank you again for 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 being here, and I appreciate your remarks, and uh, thank you for the questions, and uh, uh, and hope to do this again sometime. Thanks so much for having me, Jonathan. Mm-hmm.